Good evening. I'm Dorothy Stevens, executive producer of The Better Part. Tonight we'll join host Marilyn Priel as we recall the World War II experiences of a daring B-29 pilot. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome to The Better Part, a program by and for seniors, and devoted to exploring the many facets of those better years of our lives. The name of our program is inspired by a quotation from Robert Brown. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made. Now, sit back and enjoy a program made especially to provide seniors with useful information, plus some lighter moments to brighten your day. Attention, all pilots and crew members. Man your bombers. Start your engines. Ready to taxi into takeoff position. Hello, I'm Marilyn Priel. Join us as we interview one of those daring B-29 pilots who flew the gigantic super fortress during World War II. You're all clear for takeoff. Good luck, good bombing, may God be with you and come back safely. I'm Marilyn Priel, your host for this show. Our guest is a former World War II B-29 pilot, a historian, former basketball player for the North Carolina Tar Heels, and a contract administrator for 25 years at Stanford University. Please meet retired Captain Harry Shangan. Welcome, Harry. Hi. Maybe I can help you recall a few memories of about 50 years ago. Might interest the audience, too. I know it's going to interest me, and I know it's going to interest them as well. But before we talk about your experiences as a B-29 pilot, let's hear about how you got interested in flying as a child. Well, I was born and raised in Idaho, and in those days, there weren't any airplanes around. But we moved to San Diego in 1925 and in 1927 Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic and during that period of 1925-27 we lived down on Point Loma and every day when we would go to downtown San Diego we would buy pass uh, the Ryan Airfield next to the Naval Training Station and this tall lanky man was working on the airplane and helping the Ryan brothers build a monoplane that he would fly Later, he moved to St. Louis, where sponsors gave him some money, and he named the plane the Spirit of St. Louis. Then he went on to New York, and he flew to Paris. And it changed the whole hmm. theory of, of aviation. Did you ever see him out there working? Did you ever Oh, meet yes, him? but then, uh, you know, I don't recall uh, the exact time or place. Mm -hmm. Must have been really impressive to a little boy. It was, and in fact, impressive. Uh, when he flew the Atlantic, the first time I ever heard a radio was because they hooked one up at Ryan Field and to a loudspeaker, and a lot of us would come there to hear the reports of him flying uh, to Paris, and then later he made a tour of the United States to show the people what an airplane looked like because most of the natives in all of smaller states didn't even know what a plane looked like. When was the first time you flew? I was about 12 years old probably and I flew in a 
trimotor Ford airplane that landed at Idaho Falls, and the price was $2, which was a lot of money in those days, and it was only about a 10-minute flight, but it uh, whetted our interest. Did you play with model airplanes? Yes. Uh, back in those days, we would buy balsa wood and little kits uh, for a quarter, I guess, at the different har hardware stores or bookstores, and then we'd make planes probably weren't too good, nothing like what we have now.